Well, good morning, Grace Chapel. Good morning. It's good to sing about God's promises and His character with you. It's good to be with you this morning. Will you pray with me as we get ready to open God's Word? Heavenly Father, we do ask that you continue to fulfill your promises in our life. Uh, you have already fulfilled so many. And each and every day we rest upon the promise of salvation found in your Son alone. And so we thank you for that. But God, we know that there are still promises of sanctification and future glorification as your plan is played out. As you make us more like your Son, that these promises will be made more known to us. So God, we thank you for being a God who keeps his word. We thank you for being a God who's given us a living and active word that speaks to us. So now, Father, I pray that the text will speak. May it say to us what it must, so that we may be changed into the likeness of your Son. Will you please use your Holy Spirit's power to form us into his likeness? It's in the name of Christ and the power of the Spirit that I pray. Amen. 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 I recently heard about a hilarious exchange of gifts between a man and a wife. The, a man named Jerry Maltz bought his wife an iron for her birthday. Uh, you can only imagine how that went as he had her open the box to find an iron. His birthday wasn't that long after, and so... There was a large gift waiting for him in the kitchen. He unwrapped it to find an ironing board uh, for his birthday. <laughs> Retribution. What goes around comes around. I think all of us in our minds have a way that we think somebody should be treated or how we should act towards a person because of how we perceive that they have acted towards us, perceived. Perhaps they haven't actually been as bad as we perceived them to be, but in our mind's eye, it went down wrong. And so we're going to make sure that retribution is had. It's something that we felt as children. We probably felt it in our adolescent and teen years, and perhaps we've even felt it in our adult years, though we usually keep retaliation and retribution under control. We don't always act on it, though we may give the cold shoulder or a few acts to prove a point, but hopefully we're not acting on it as much as our wicked hearts tell us we should. The man we're going to meet in the text today was a man who was full of retribution. I call him belligerent. He had a way of wanting to make sure he proved his point and he went after it, making sure anyone who crossed him was finally given what they deserved, and in his opinion, that was death. His name was Abimelech. He's Gideon's son. We've studied Gideon over the last couple of weeks, and today we will dive into studying his son, the son of Gideon, Abimelech. It literally means, my father is king. And I've entitled the message, Belligerent or Peaceful. Now, we're going to learn very quickly that he himself was absolutely belligerent. There was nothing kind about Abimelech. In fact, his, his growing resentment towards everyone else in his life played out in all of his actions, yet alone his thoughts and his motives. We're going to see that he was belligerent. He was not peaceful. But the question should be asked of us, will we be belligerent people or will we be peaceful people? We're all called to leadership. Every Christian, every person is leading someone. You're influencing someone. We're all called to lead people to find and follow Jesus and to make disciples. We should be peaceful in the way that we approach it, not belligerent or have belliosity, if you've heard that word. It means aggression or a warlike mentality, always up for the fight. Abimelech, he had belliosity. He had aggressiveness. He was warlike in all of his attitudes. And we're going to learn from him that if you don't act in a pleasing way to God, and if you continue to strive to have more power, it will be detrimental to your soul. Let me say that one more time. If you do not act in a pleasing way to God, and instead can sin, continue to prove, pursue absolute power or some kind of uh, resolve of, of you over everyone else, it will be detrimental to your soul. Let me show you that from the poor example of Abimelech. Open up your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 33 all the way through chapter 9, almost 60 verses to plow through today. You can find my notes on the Grace Chapel app. Together we will encounter God through this wretched man, and we will see a warning for us, a way we should not live, 
A man who I would say is not a judge, he is not a king, he is not a leader, he is the anti of all of that. He is not someone we should be like, but from his life, we will learn how then we should not live, and I will leave you with some positive things on what we should do to make sure that we live more like Christ and less like Abimelech. I got to tell you, as I was uh, getting into this passage this week in my study, I, I, we're, we're, you know, we're at chapter 9, there's 21 chapters, we're almost halfway, it's getting worse every week, every story's worse. I, I literally, it was standing there in my office, I got up out of my seat, and I'm rubbing my chin and rubbing my face, and I'm like, maybe we should just stop the study of Judges. Like, we should just give up, we should abandon ship, like, these guys are a mess. I was getting frustrated, I live with these guys all week, right? Like, Abimelech's been with me all week. I don't like him, I don't like him at all. I can't stand him, and I can't wait to get this sermon done and move on, but the next guy's just as bad, if not worse, right? So the outlook of my life is fantastic over the next coming months. So I thought maybe we should stop. We should just do sermons on love or purpose or why habits change your life. And then I thought, no, at Grace Chapel, we preach the whole counsel of God. So let's go. Let's dive in. Let's ingest what God has for us and unpack it. It's important for you as at this point in the book of Judges to have a, a mindset for what we are about to face. That is this. You are going to see worse wickedness than we have already encountered. The judges only get worse. There are stories coming that are going to blow your mind. And as we go into all of these, you'll say, it's such wickedness. How is this in the Bible? So before I even read the passage for today and introduce you to this king, let me just give you a preamble. Wickedness exists in the heart of men. Wickedness is in all of us, and wickedness is something that God hates. God hates wicked people. In fact, if you look at Psalm 11, verse 5, you don't have to go there. I'll throw it up on the screen for you. It talks about God sitting on his throne. He looks to and fro with his eyes. His eyelids, blink, blink, test the righteous. But then it says this, the Lord tests the righteous his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. <laughs> the Lord hates the wicked. He hates from the very depths of his being their ways, as Proverbs 15.9 says. He hates the wicked's thoughts, as 15, Proverbs 15.26 says. He hates what the wicked worship. That's also in Proverbs 15. He hates the actions of the wicked, Proverbs 6. And Psalm 5, 5 points to us that he hates all of the evil deeds of the wicked. And in Psalm 11, it says that he hates the wicked, the thoughts, the deeds, and the desires of evil people. Hates them. He has righteous revulsion against the wicked. So I have a good morning message for you. We are all wicked. We are the wicked. Who does God hate? Us. What? Really? We should have visited another church, you're thinking to yourself. No, this is right. This is right. This is right. We, we are wicked, but my friends, there is a hope for the wicked. By the end of our time together, I want to show you that just as sin came in and sowed wickedness into all of us through one man, there is one who is righteous and has done away with our wickedness and set it aside. So with that as the welcome mat to our passage, we wipe our feet and go, okay, here we go, walking into the wickedness of Abimelech. We're introduced to him in chapter 8. Verse 31, it says, And a concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. That's where we first meet this man. We're picking up the story of Gideon. You could see this as a continuation of Gideon's story. And Abimelech, a man's name that means my father is king, a boy named that by a man who was all about perhaps his own righteousness in the end, though he said in verse 23, Gideon said, don't make me God, the Lord is God. He seems to say, I'm going to pass on a lineage of my God-likeness, so no one will forget me, and names his son, my father is king. It's his half-son, 
His son is born of a concubine. He has 70 other sons. You can see there in the preceding verse, verse 30 of chapter 8, Gideon had 70 sons of his own offspring, many wives. And then he had a concubine in Shechem, a Canaanite town, a woman that he slept with who gave birth to a half-Israelite, half-Canaanite boy named Abimelech. Abimelech is one who wants to become king who's going to strive hard to pursue king-like qualities in his life. You'll see that as we journey through this passage. But just to give you a bit of the setting of what's happening, these people had forgotten the one true God. Look at verse 33. Gideon dies. He's the man who was raised up as a judge, brought 40 years of peace to the people, saved them out of the hand of Midian. He dies, and the people of Israel turn against and whore after the Baals and made Baal Berit their God. They prostituted after, as one translation says. They went and gave themselves over to a, another God. And specifically, the name of the God is listed for us here Baal Berit. Baals are the different gods that are opposite of the one true God. Baal Berit was the God of Shechem, it literally means God of the covenant. So these covenant people who are in a covenant relationship with the one true God, the one true God who is the God of the promise, the one who, true God who does give us the covenant, that God back in Deuteronomy who promised himself, that God who at the beginning of Judges chapter 6 said he would save the people, the real God who is the promise keeper, that's the God they turned against for another false God, God of the covenant, small g. They start Worshiping this God, and then verse 34, the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all of their enemies. <laughs> they had forgotten God. And now they find themselves in this place of the enemy growing up from within. They had forgotten God previously. This is not our first instance of this. But now they've forgotten God so long, maybe all four decades, the last few years of the last decade, I don't know how long, but they had forgotten God, worshipped false gods, worshipped Baal Berit, the God of the covenant, small g, the Canaanite God that they should not have been worshipping, and God says, okay, have it your way. He hands them over to a new ruler, Abimelech. Verse 1, now Abimelech, the son of Jerob Baal, that's Gideon, But we will no longer see him named Gideon anywhere in this passage. He will now be called by his Canaanite name. And if you'll remember from our previous study, Jerob Baal is the name that means to contend with Baal, to contend with the false gods of Baal, and to win over the false gods of Baal. However, I think the author's making a point here. He's calling him by his name, the, the Baal contender, several different times in this passage. In fact, we're going to see 27 times this word Baal used over and over and over in 57 verses, all to make the point they had left the one true God and had given themselves over to the false god of Baal. Even if it is the last half of Jerob Baal's name, it's used time and again. So the reader picks up, oh, we have left the camp of Yahweh the one true God, and we have entered into enemy territory. Abimelech, the son of Jerambaal, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them and to the whole clan of the mother's family, say it in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 sons of Jerambaal rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also, I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he is our brother. This is the first time that we see a judge rise up by his own accord. God didn't say, Abimelech, you lead forward. It was this man grabbing his way to leadership, kingship, and judgeship by his own fingernails. He's going to do whatever he can to lead these people. So much so that now he even says to his mother's side of the family, come on, don't you guys want to follow me? Am I not better than all of my 70 brothers who most likely were of Israelite descent? 
Follow me, I'm bone of your bone, I'm flesh of your flesh. You should follow me. So verse four, look what they did. They gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baalberit, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. Okay, fine. We'll make you leader, end of three. You're our brother. We'll take money from our false god, Steal it from his offering, 70 shekels. Remember that number. We're going to give it to you, and you go forward and be our king. Seemingly, nobody's following him. He had these rumors spread amongst his aunts and uncles. I'm best, better than all of my brothers to lead. You should let me lead. So he starts to lead forward. He doesn't have anyone following, so he buys followers. Worthless and reckless men. I think this is just like a picture out of a movie, right? I picture them. There's one-eyed Phil who's sitting over there, and there's the guy who's missing four limbs, and then you have the guy who's eating the chicken leg, but he's getting it all over himself. And they're just like the most. You're like, you're like, really? This is going to be your army? But he pays worthless and reckless men to then go and do what? Verse five. He takes them, and he went to his father's house, Ophrah, and killed his brothers, the son of Jeroboam. Seventy men, one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerembel, was left, for he hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together. And all Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar of Shechem. He thought he had arrived. That phrase is even the author doing something there. They went and made Abimelech king. They went and made my father is king, king. He is now taking the place of his father and he is now ruling. They made him king. The worthless and reckless followers went with him to murder 70 brothers. If we had that kind of murder happen today, all of the world would be on the front porch of Otham's house reporting on this mass murder. Seventy brothers killed, less one. One got away, a guy named Jotham, the youngest of all of them. He hid himself and he was not killed. But the other 69 were murdered and placed upon one stone. Most likely that means they were placed upon a large, flat, maybe 25-foot stone that was there as an altar to Baal or other gods. He murdered all of his brothers and piled their bodies as a sacrifice to a false god. That's mind-blowing. How did he do it? How did not one of them kill him? How did he take them all out? His, his ungodliness was so over the top that he saw the brothers that he had, certainly he'd shared relationship with, played with growing up, had all sorts of other things in common with. Those brothers now became his enemy and he said, I'm gonna do whatever I can to make sure there is no competition. I'm killing them all and sacrificing them to a false god. There's two problems I see in this passage and two consequences. The first problem is this, absence of godliness. He had absolute absence of godliness. Here's a man who knew about Yahweh, who grew up in an Israelite's home, who should have known what it was like to serve the one true God. Yes, Gideon was a mess of a man, but he still had the blessing of God and was placed in his position by God. He knew the stories of the one true God, yet he had absolute absence of godliness. One brother got away, Jotham. This guy hid himself. That'll be important in a moment because Jotham then becomes seemingly a mouthpiece to speak about what will happen with Abimelech's life because he has forgotten God. Before we go too far, though, I want to point out that 70 shekels were given from the temple of Baal and 70 lives were taken. The author's doing something with his words here. Almost to say Abimelech counted the lives of his brothers as nothing more, worth more than a coin, a shekel. They were of no value to him. His godliness was of no value to him. And should we even dare to say that God himself was of no value to him? Let me ask you a question. What is your godliness worth to you? Do you fight 
to be as godly and Christ-centered as you possibly can in your life? Are you pursuing the disciplines of godliness so that you can have righteousness before God? Forget what other people say. Forget what other people see. Are you pursuing godliness at all cost? And not only that, but do you value God enough to say, I'm not going to allow sin to be a part of my life. I'm not going to let evil and wickedness overcome me. My friends, evil sneaks into our life when we perceive that our God and our godliness is of little value. When you see God and godliness as nothing more than a small portion of your life, a tenant in your building, rather than the owner of your property, then my friends, evil will sneak its way in. You will have a cheap view of grace. Oh, I have God. I have a relationship with God. I was saved but I'm going to go on doing these things in my life that I know I probably shouldn't be doing. That's a cheap view of grace. And if you don't have a high view of your godliness and more importantly, a high view of God himself, then you will live with the I want what I want when I want it kind of mindset. And that's all you're going to pursue. And you're going to have absolute disregard for what God wants in your life. Perhaps you don't value your godliness or even your God as much as you should. I read a a summary of a book recently entitled Influence by a a man named Robert Cialdini, a a prof at Arizona State University. He's talking about influence in leadership. And he tells this story about a a jewelry store owner who went on a vacation and was disappointed that this one line of her jewelry was not selling. And in, in a rush to get out the door, she wrote a note that didn't quite make sense to the employees But she left anyway and came back and basically what she was trying to communicate was uh, mark this jewelry half price, just get it out. But her note wasn't clear. She returned, she was delighted to see that all of the jewelry was gone, it had completely sold out, but she came to find out that her staff misunderstood her note and instead of halving the price, they doubled the price. They doubled the price of the jewelry and the pieces that hadn't been selling flew out the door because immediately, once the price was raised or doubled, it changed the way people thought about that line of jewelry. Perhaps your godliness is like that. Perhaps your God needs to be like that. Listen, you don't add any worth to God. God is worth more than you could ever imagine. He doesn't need you adding worth to him. But your perspective might need to change. Perhaps you're not valuing him or the pursuit of him or godliness enough. So you're like, well, I'm not getting to the quiet time that I know I should be having. I'm not living with full integrity the the way that I should. But everything's fine. It's not hurting anyone. And you're cheapening grace. And you're not valuing God and godliness enough in your life. I think that was Abimelech's problem. (laughs) That's the understatement of the sermon. For sure, that was Abimelech's problem. He did not value God or godliness at all. And Jotham stands up and calls attention to all of the followers. In verse 7, he says, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. This one little brother, the youngest of them all, the pipsqueak of the crowd, runs up to Mount Gerizim. He's standing on the top of it, and he begins telling a parable or a prophecy of what will happen to his brutal older brother. He says, listen to me, value God, value what God has to say, or else it will be for your destruction. The author is doing something with even the characters at play. He's using Jotham. Jotham is a combination of two Hebrew words, Yahweh and Tamim. It means God is perfect or Yahweh is perfect. Yahweh is blameless. Yahweh is the honest one. So the very man who's speaking, seemingly saying the God of the covenant, the God who promised you that he would do everything right, the God who was blameless, the God who's valued above all things, that God is the God you should listen to, not Abimelech, and yet they didn't seem to take the warning. Jotham shares this parable of four trees. It's a parable about who will become a king, but he's using trees as his example. 
He uses an olive tree, and the olive tree says, I can't become a king, i got to go make olives. And the fig tree says, I can't become a king, i got to go make figs. And the vine says, I can't become a king, i got to keep making grapes. And then finally he comes to the thorn bush. And the thorn bush communicates back, sure, I'll, I'll be king. Look at verse 15. And the bramble said to the trees, if in good faith you're anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. What? Well, hold on. There's no shade in a thorn bush. That's a lie. And if there is any shade, it's painful shade, right? How do you get shade from a thorn bush? If you, if you, if you make me king, take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Wait, what? Fire comes out of a bramble, out of a thorn bush? What? All of this was a picture of what would come through Abimelech. Fire emerging from a thorn bush. Remember that. Problem number one, a lack of godliness, absence of godliness. Consequence number one, discord and lack of peace. Abimelech had a lack of godliness and so God says, fine, I will make sure you have a lack of peace. He is the king of kings, the prince of peace, the God of all peace. He is the God of shalom, the God of rest. And he's saying your consequence will be infighting, destruction, and lack of peace. Pick up verse 22 with me as God now shows up on the scene. Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. Not very long. Shortest of all the judges. And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come, and their blood be laid on Abimelech their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hand to kill his brothers. And the leaders of Shechem put men in ambush against him on the mountaintops, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way. And it was told to Abimelech. Summary of these three verses would be, God says, enough. Abimelech, your evil, your wickedness, has risen to my attention and no more. I'm done. Remember Psalm 11, verse 5. He hates the wicked. He hates the violent. He had killed 70 brothers. Look at verse 24. That the, the death he had caused the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come, basically come back against him. For what he did to kill them, it will now be against him. Look at what God does. God sent an evil spirit. In Gideon's life, we saw God send the Holy Spirit and help him, anoint him with the Spirit in chapter 6, verse 34. Now we have an evil spirit sent by God. Wait, God does that? God could send an evil spirit between Abimelech and the people that were following him? Yes, he's God over all things. He's God over every spirit. He's even God over the dominion of darkness, the evil spirits. We're told in the New Testament that the demons know him and they even shudder. Yeah, they tremble. <laughs> so when this guy, this evil spirit comes and the one true God says, I'm sending you between Abimelech and his people. That demon wasn't like, I don't work for you. Well, he might have been, but he was probably like, okay, fine, I'll do whatever you want because destruction and death is what I'm about. So you, being God of the universe, send me where you want. Sends him in and causes division, a total change, an about face from the people of Shechem who adored Abimelech. And now they are against him. God allows that to happen. Not only does God allow that as a consequence, discord there amongst them, but then he allows an enemy to emerge. Verse 26, And Gal, the son of Eben, moved into Shechem with his relatives, and the leaders of che Shechem put confidence in him. Okay, so now there's discord with the people, and there's a new guy on the scene. And the people start saying, Impeach Abimelech, impeach Abimelech. We want him out, we're done with him. Get away from us, Abimelech. Gaul of Ebed, you are our new leader. And they start following this guy that seemingly comes out of nowhere. 
The cat mouse chase goes all the way through verse 38. Verse 27, the people go out into the field and they gather the grapes from the vineyards. They trod them and held a festival. They're ready to party. We have a new leader. Yes, Abimelech's out. Gal is in. They went into the house of their God and they ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. If they just smashed grapes, then you can guess what they drank. There is an evil spirit in this story, but now there is the spirit of drunkenness at play, and they are all against Abimelech. Gaul is part of God's allowance of a consequence in Abimelech's life. And isn't it ironic that now Gaul shows up in verse 28 and starts leading in the same way Abimelech did, by asking questions. Verse 28, Gaul, the son of Eden, said, Who is Abimelech, and who are we of Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerembel, and is it not Zebel, his officer? Serve the men of Hammer, the father of Shechem. But why would we serve him? Would, Would that these people were under my hand? Then I would remove Abimelech. I would say to Abimelech, increase your army. Come out and fight me. (laughs) All of this consequence for ungodliness. My friends, a heart that lacks godliness is an affront against God first. And it will be stopped. Evil spirits sent evil ruler to take away his loyalty or his loyal followers, all allowed by God's hand. If we go on with a lack of godliness in our life, we are on a crash collision course with God himself. If you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you don't live like a Christian, God sees and God knows. Ah, but, but doesn't it say that he turns his face away from my sin? Maybe he doesn't see everything. Bad theology. Stop excusing it. He is everywhere. He knows everything. And your sin, as a professing believer in Christ, is sin against God Almighty. And the tiniest grudge, the tiniest little private sin, the tiniest motive, the tiniest thought, the tiniest action, all of these things are between you and God if you continue to foster them. And they will zap you clean of spiritual power. They will pull from you the saturation that you should have of the knowledge of God and you will be back to finding your way through life on your own strength, which to me sounds absolutely miserable. I was laying in bed with my kids the other day and I, I was playing the game about hey, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? And they said, Dad, where would you go? And it was just one of those days I didn't really like myself that day for various reasons, and I said, well, if somebody would sell me a round-trip ticket to get away from myself, I would pay, no matter what price it was. <laughs> and the kids are like, now that's deep. You would, you would pay to get away from, you don't make sense, Dad. You know, like, but, but that's how I felt. I was like, just get me away from myself. Lack of power, lack of spiritual blessing, lack of peace, Perhaps it's because you're harboring something in your heart and your thoughts and your actions and your motives that you shouldn't be harboring. Problem number two. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Abimelech wanted absolute power. I'm after it. I'm going to get it. He fights Gaul all through these verses, through verse 38, we see this battle going on. I want to point out something to you in verse 34. It says, Abimelech and all the men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem in four companies. So he had four companies, likely 400 people, worthless and reckless men that he's paying to follow him, but they're following him nonetheless. Remember that number four. Four, verse 34. 39, and Gaul went out 
at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. So Gaul's now fighting against Abimelech, taking the followers that were once faithful to Abimelech. He's now bringing them against Abimelech. Verse 40, and Abimelech chased him and he fled before him and many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. He was fighting for domination. He was not going to be stopped. Verse 42, on the following day, the people went out into the field and Abimelech was told, basically, they're vulnerable. They're in the open. They're out in the field. So verse 43, he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the field. Wait, how many companies were there in chapter, in verse 34? Four. Now we're down to three. Verse 43, he divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the field. And he looked and saw the people coming out of the city. So he rose against them and killed them. Murder, murder, murder. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city while the two companies rushed upon... Wait, 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 wait. Now we went from four to three to two. Wait for it. One is coming. While the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all the day. He captured the city and killed the people who were in it. And he razed the city, plowed the city, and he sowed it with salt. He was fighting for domination. He went against Gaul. I get that. It's an enemy trying to take his people. But he wasn't satisfied at just killing Gaul. He wanted to kill every person in the town. He became a power-hungry barbarian. Four, three, two, ready to explode and destroy everybody that was in his path. Verse 46, when all the leaders of the town of Shechem heard of it, they entered the stronghold of the house of El Barit. This is the temple of this false god that they worship. Remember, it's the god that he was worshiping. It's the god they were all worshiping. He now goes to that temple. They're all hiding there. Abimelech was told that the leaders, that all the leaders of the tower of Shechem were gathered together, and Abimelech went up to the mountain of Zalman. He and all the people who were with him and Abimelech took an ax in his hand and he cut down a bundle of brushwood, hmm, a bramble, a thorn bush. He cut down a bundle of brushwood and he took it up and he laid it on his shoulders and he said to the men who were with him, what you have seen me do, hurry and do as I have done because in righteousness always says, I'm right and you should do it too. Do what I have done, he says. So everyone cut down his bundle and followed Abimelech and put it against the stronghold. And they set the stronghold on fire. Set it on fire. Fire from the bramble. Fire from the thorn bush. Verse 15, the prophecy of Jotham's coming true. They set the stronghold on fire over them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem also died, about 1,000 men and women. Wow. His thirst for power made him not only an ally with Satan, but an ally with Baal. He did whatever he thought was right. He did whatever would feed his soul. And so fire, take them all out. 70 siblings killed, less one. Gaul and his men killed. A thousand people in Shechem, his own people killed. This craze for power caused him to live in Absolute ungodliness. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I'm going to guess, I'm going to assume, I'm going to pray that most of us here don't exert this kind of physical violence, never will in our life. Most of us don't hurt someone to this effect, take these lives away. But listen to me. Anything that happens in your life to display power in the wrong way, is satanic. God allows for us to have dominion over certain things in our life. But for us to abuse power, pursue power, or strive for absolute power, taking God's place in our life, it's wrong and it's opposite of God. Well, we here at Grace Chapel take these kinds of things very serious. When someone's 
dominating or, or hurting someone else. Uh, I hope that never becomes a problem here. I, I hope that doesn't go on. But listen to me. We should look at the text and allow the text to be a mirror for our own soul. Say to me what you need to say. And I think what it's saying is kill the little Abimelech in you. Maybe I don't go around burning people's houses down or murdering people. But my friend, if you're slamming doors, you're hitting walls, you're throwing things, you're raising your voice all to somehow prove that you have absolute power in a moment, kill the little Abimelech in you. That's not how we live. That's not how we go forward as Christians. Allow me to share with you an unflattering story of myself. This summer, we went on a story, uh, on a vacation, uh, and, and the story goes like this. I show up at the airport. I got six kids in tow, my wife, all the bags. My wife had to go check in at another desk, so I am now left alone with all of the bags and all of the kids, okay? And I have to somehow get us to the counter, and then we're going to meet back up with Molly and go to the gate. So I do all the check-in stuff, and getting kids through an airport, it just... It just does something to your soul, you know? It just does something. Like Charlie's laying down on the floor and Patton's licking the self-check-in kiosk. And you're like, why? Do you guys not understand germs? What's happening? Why, why is this happening? So I'm just like, let's get through this process as fast as I can. So I type my stuff in. We get the labels. You know, the bag tags come out. And I move all of us towards the counter. And I'm putting the bag tags on the bags. I have two bag tags on all of our six bags. And I'm about to check them in. Two, two are tagged, four are not tagged. I show up at the counter, and there's this lady, and she says, Sir, are all of your bags tagged? And I'm thinking, no, they're not. Two of them are tagged, but should I tell her that? So I told her that. I said, okay, listen, only two are tagged. The rest I will tag while you get these through. And I'm trying in the meanwhile to get, keep all my Philistines on the camp, right? Would you guys just stand still for a second? We're trying to get through this. And she says to me, Sir... You cannot approach the counter until all of your bags are tagged. So I'm thinking, <laughs> I have to back up with all of my bags and all of my kids, which I didn't. So she moved over and she walked down the counter. And this is what she went to do. She, she stood at the counter and she said, excuse me, folks, do not approach the counter until all of your bags are tagged. Oh, I could feel it rising up, man. I could feel it. And I'm thinking, this is not going to go well for me, for her, for my kids. But I'm standing there, and I'm just putting the bag tags on, getting a little bit more aggressive. I finally get it all done, and I step one more inch closer to the counter. I face the wall, and I say, my bags are now tagged. <laughs> Would someone please help me? <laughs> Oh, friends, it just was, it was, there was nothing glorious about it. My wife, she's coming over at this time. She's like, what is going on? That lady comes back because of my yelling. She's looking at me and I'm just looking at her. We're like, well, I'm not breaking eye contact. <laughs> I go, what's your name? She tells me her name. It was right on her badge, but she still tells me her name. What was I going to do with that? Like, go tell on her? Like, I thought it was an imitation. You know, I was trying to imitate her. What, or, uh, intimidate her. What's your name? Like, nothing happens. We walk away. We're going up the escalator. I'm stomping, even though the escalator's still going up, right? My kids are like, what was that about, Dad? I was like, that lady was in the wrong. I need to make sure she knows it, right? There was nothing godly about that. Nothing. It was a terrible moment. I had to repent to my kids, repent to my wife. Kill the little Abimelechs in you. They're there more than you know. And they rear their ugly head when you're cut off in traffic or the line doesn't go the way you want it to go or the hand you've been dealt seems absolutely unfair. We are God's leaders. We are God's people. We are not Satan's. So we don't act ungodly. Abimelech kept going with his ungodliness. Verse 50 and 52, look at it with me. He had already taken out Shechem, thousand men and women, as if that wasn't enough. Then Abimelech went to Thebes, 
and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city and all the men and the women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in and they went up to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. The thorn bush strikes again. Why? What did Thebes do to you? Why? This is classic kick the dog syndrome. He's just mad. He wants retribution. He wants absolute power. And it corrupted him absolutely to the point that he goes to this innocent, sleepy town and exerts some kind of power. There is no torment like that of wanting to prove yourself and your power to other people. That will eat your lunch every day. If you go on thinking, I somehow have to make sure I am the most powerful in my life. My employees must know, my kids must know, my wife must know, my dog must know, everyone on the road must know. That will eat your lunch. That is an unforgiving spirit that refuses to be healed. You've been given the grace of God he gave you everything. He, he forgave you. And you have to go show your power to the rest of the world? Come on. That is absolutely not okay. If you live that way, you will reap what you sow. And the Bible tells us you will reap death. Consequence number two. You reap what you sow. Death in Gideon's case. What, what, what you place in the ground, what, 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 you, what you try to foster in your life, how you try to get back at people, it will come back to you. This is not some Christian karma I'm talking about. The Bible seems to tell us time and again that you reap what you sow. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. The key verse that I would share with you is Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Meaning you cannot pull the wool over God's eyes. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. That word in the Greek is literally the stench of death, a dying corpse. You sow according to the flesh, you will reap death. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. The Bible tells us clearly, you go on having some kind of belligerent, resentful, I've got to prove my point attitude, you will reap what you sow. Ungodliness and the desire for absolute power will destroy you in the end. It will hurt you more than it hurts anyone else. Perhaps you've heard that if a rattlesnake is cornered and feels like it can't get out or attack what's cornering it, it will bite itself. In the same way, you go on in ungodliness, striving for retribution and absolute power. It's like biting yourself with venom. The consequence clearly came around for Abimelech. Four, three, two, one. Verse 53. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. That verse 53, Judges 9.53, our translation says a certain woman, but in the original language, it actually just says, and one woman. A woman works, but the text is doing something. The divine author's showing us something. One woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head. Four, three, two, one. Judges chapter 9, verse 2 started with Abimelech saying, what's better for you, 70 sons or one man? And then in verse 5 of Judges 9, we see that he slays all of his brothers on one stone. One man, one stone. One woman, one stone. You reap what you sow. Like Jabel, in the story we've read before in Judges, this man didn't want to 
die at the hand of a, a woman. So he says to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed me. Prideful to his last breath. Skull cracked. Still thinking about self-aggrandizement. Ha, jeez. So his guard kills him. And it just simply says, everybody went home. God repaid him. You sow, you reap. You sow, you reap. Look at verse 56. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his fathers in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of this men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. What Jotham said came true. It was fulfilled. The sowing and the reaping principle is all throughout Scripture. It's part of life. Sow, you reap. You give an iron, you might get an ironing board. But it's also a spiritual lesson for all of us. In the spiritual world, when we reap from evil, we will then reap destruction. When we reap from good, we will reap kindness and ultimately eternal life, which is found only in Jesus Christ. There is hope for us. We are little Abimelechs. But the hope for us is that there is one Jesus Christ who has come and made it so that our righteousness is set aside, or excuse me, our wickedness is set aside and the righteousness of Christ is given to us. Our wickedness and our evil set aside. Righteousness given to us. Imputed. That means put into your account. Placed in you because of God's goodness. Your wickedness, your evil, God hates it. But God had a plan to redeem even the wicked and the evil, his enemies, and call them unto himself. My friends, ceasing godliness and striving for power, it will lead you to spiritual death. Hear that warning clear from this passage. You will have a lack of God's presence and you will have a lack of God's peace in your life if you cease being godly and you strive to just have more power. How does that show up, Pastor Josh? I'm glad you asked. It shows up by us being control freaks, having aggression in our relationships, being contentious and quarrelsome. That's you striving for power or maybe not being kind and ceasing to have godliness. It shows up in hostility towards other people and towards God. It shows up in defiance against God's commands. It shows up in having a murderous spirit Wanting others to be dead and, and trying your best to bury them in your mind, if not also by your actions. It's an unconcern for God's interests in your life. Those things lead to a lack of God's presence and a lack of God's power in your life. God was present, though his name wasn't used till the end of this chapter. He was fully on the throne till the very end, and it's proven with the last two verses. God's way won. So where is there hope for us? My friends, wickedness entered through one man, Adam, into all of us. But so righteousness is now imputed to all of us, sown in of all of us. Adam sowed, we reap. Christ sowed, we reap. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 through 19 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, one sin from the first Adam condemned all of us, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience we were made many sinners, wicked and evil, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. That washes us clean. The belligerent evil spirit that is within all of us is replaced with peace, shalom. God says, I will give you my son, my prince of peace. May you have peace with me and may you have peace with everyone else. Trust me, trust my righteousness. Don't take matters into your own hands. Let me be God, abide in Christ. 
A young boy was trying his best to move this massive suitcase. He's pushing and pulling and he can't move it. And his dad heard the grunts from the other room. His dad came in and said, son, what's happening? And the red-faced youngster said, dad, I'm trying to move the suitcase and I can't do it. I, I tried. And he tells him all the ways that he tried with his feet and pushing it and getting a chair. And finally, his dad said, you, try, you didn't try one thing. And the boy said, dad, I tried everything. He said, you didn't call me to move it. The dad lifts up the suitcase and moves it with one hand and sets it aside. So in the same way, my friends, God takes our evil and our wickedness and he says, I'm done with that. Now my son, be like my son. And he replaces what should be our destruction with now the richest inheritance that can only be found in Jesus Christ. When we confess the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, he says all of his inheritance, everything that's willed to him is not willed to you. It's yours. I was thinking this morning, how am I going to apply this message this week? And I started thinking, okay, what's a stimulus and then a response? Something that I could remember to do when it happens and then how I could respond. Here's what I came up with. You could come up with your own application. But I'm thinking, what I'm going to do is every time I lift something, which I lift a lot of somethings, specifically a two-year-old something all the time. I'm constantly lifting him. But if I lift my hands to send a message or I lift my fingers to type, or lift the groceries out of the car. When, when it comes to my mind, when I'm lifting something, I'm going to let that be my stimulus. My response is going to be this. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I rest in you. Oh, I want you to carry me, not my own efforts. I want to have heartfelt obedience that trusts heaven's outcome. So whenever I lift something... I'm simply going to say, Lord, I trust you. Have it your way, Father, not my way. Whatever prompt you need this week that will help you remember that the righteousness of Christ has been given to you, don't take matters into your own hands. Come on, do it. Apply it to your own life. And let's kill the little Abimelechs in all of us. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for your righteousness given to us through Christ. We pray that you will help us continue to rest upon the promises that have been given to us through your graciousness, your love, and your power. God, we thank you for what you have given us in Christ, and I pray that by him and the Spirit's power in our life, we will fight against the evil and the wickedness that so easily creeps in. May we be abandoned children abiding in Christ for the whole of our life. In the name of Christ, we pray, and all God's people said, amen.